Geeks. Welcome back to the final episode of the Oklahoma State University's Archives Live for the semester. My name is Olivia Turner, and today I am joined by David Peters, the head archivist for the OSU Library, and Lynn Wallace, the library director for OSU Tulsa. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. It's going to be fun. Doing great. Yeah, I look forward to the conversation. It is going to be a very, very great day today. But this Archives Live is going to be a little bit different. Not only are we meeting virtually, but we are also talking about an extremely significant event that has taken place 100 years ago. It was the Tulsa Race Massacre, an event with great loss to, of Black citizens' life and the destruction of Black-owned businesses and homes in North Tulsa that began on May 31st, 1921. It lasted for 18 hours. Now, David, could you tell me a little bit about what Oklahoma and Tulsa were like in the early 1920s? So, Olivia, that, that's a pretty big question. Uh, you have to remember that in the early 20s, Oklahoma is, is just well, it's less than 15 years out from statehood. So we're still kind of getting uh, uh, an understanding of what it means to be a state uh, at that time. Uh, we've begun the transition from being a predominantly rural state before statehood. We're still a rural state in the early 20s, but we're beginning to establish cities, um, and Tulsa being one of them, that it's grown dramatically. Uh, in the decade before the 1920s. Um, what's happened uh, across the state, um, uh, we've, uh, we had a, uh, well, we had episodes uh, of uh, racism um, that occurred uh, both before statehood, but after statehood in 1907, more and more uh, cases of uh, lynching of black people, uh, whippings of black uh, members of, of communities. Uh, and Tulsa wasn't the first community to have a situation where uh, black citizens were driven out of town uh, and their homes and businesses destroyed. That happened in several other cities, uh, mostly in the Eastern part of the state where it was formerly the, the Indian territories, um, which it also was mostly settled by people coming from the South. And, and so there's a strong correlation between those who settled in the Eastern part of the state. Uh, and then the, the, those who settled in the Western part of the state mostly came from the Midwest. So there were fewer lynchings uh, in the Western part of the state. Uh, but by statehood, the, the lynchings have, have converted mostly to, to African-American uh, and usually males. Um, it's also a time of transition. Uh, World War I has ended. Uh, and so now you have a, a number of people who are returning back to the states. Uh, the uh, commodities market is changing. You know, during the war, commodity prices went up. Uh, now, right after the war, commodities prices are beginning to go down. Um, and you have African-American citizens who served in World War I who are now returning to Tulsa. And, and you know, they've served their country uh, and they know that they have, have rights. Um, and you know, Jim Crow laws are, are beginning to take hold in Oklahoma and there's some resistance to that now. And, and so it's, it's really a, a time of transition. Uh, also Tulsa is, is exploding in part because of all the oil uh, money that's now uh, coming in from, from fields uh, both uh, north of Tulsa and west of Tulsa. Uh, and so uh, Tulsa is kind of a little boom town um, and the area of Greenwood is a, is a boom area for African-American citizens. So it's, it's really a, a challenging and, and difficult time uh, with a lot of things going on. So that, that's kind of a quick, quick and dirty summary, but I think that kind of sets the stage, hopefully, for what happens. Absolutely. Um, Lynn, could you give me a little bit of history about the events that took place 100 years ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Sure. Um, so, you know, how all of this was triggered was one event. And um, I always like to start discussion of this to say, this history is really rich and really deep. And there's so many layers to it that we can't talk about every single component of it. So we're gonna kind of broad brush stroke this. Um, there's much more information available in books and videos and whatnot, but, you know, David set the stage. There was a lot of racism. There was a lot of um, what we call nationalism going on, where there was a group of men in Tulsa that were in everybody else's business, and the KKK was starting to become more um, active, as well as a few other organizations, and um, they really had a lot of power in Tulsa. Um, with the police department, with the federal, with the local government, and um, 
we had a newspaper at the time called the Tulsa Tribune that also had leanings towards some racism as well. So uh, the event that sparked the race massacre was a young, um, young adult named Dick Rowland. The newspapers like to tag him as Diamond Dick, although that was his nickname. Um, he gets arrested for potentially or allegedly attacking a girl in an elevator. And um, a, at that point, white mobs, white men show up to the courthouse as well as armed black citizens. Um, back and forth happens, shuffle of, you know, um, back and forth with yelling and arguments. Black citizens leave, they come back, um, they hear about pop potential lynching. And then somehow a scuffle happens, a gun goes off and the riot is on. By the end of the first night, um, the black citizens moved back into their area of Greenwood to kind of hold, hold fort and uh, get protections and, and they, they hold off. Um, there's a lot of shooting going on all throughout downtown and uh, a lot of just people dying, murders happening. So at 5.02 in the morning on June 1st, um, a, a whistle goes off and white citizens invade Greenwood. They uh, force black citizens out of their homes. Then they loot the homes and burn them and businesses. Um, it's not just home, it's businesses. And I think to kind of understand Greenwood was nicknamed Black Wall Street um, because it was highly, highly successful and numbers of um, Black families were coming to Tulsa to find refuge from massive Jim Crow. So at the end, 35 blocks of Greenwood have been burned and hundreds of um, people are, are killed. And then numbers and numbers of people have fled, never to return again. Well. Lynn, you did this interview with the University of Southern Florida, and I thought it was really interesting to hear about the concept of yellow journalism and how it contributed to the incident. Could you tell me a little bit more about the newspaper article that really fueled this event? Okay, so yeah, the Tulsa Tribune published, a, they were the afternoon paper. So they would come out, out right about the time that everybody get off work, come home and have dinner. And it was the, it was the newspaper you'd read around the dinner table or right after dinner. And uh, so an article titled Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator um, was published about Dick Rowland's arrest and the alleged assault um, in the Drexel building is where the assault had happened. And it talks about that he attacked her and she claims that um, so he scratched her hands and her face um, kept, tore her clothes. And it was very incendiary. And for, for those who don't really understand a lot about yellow journalism, it is that sensationalized headline that comes across. It is to try and, and capture the reader. And the newspaper man who owned the Tulsa Tribune was in a large amount of debt and he needed to sell newspapers. So he also supposedly, and I'm not gonna say just supposedly, it's true that he did publish an editorial called To Lynch a Negro Tonight. But here is the biggest mystery problem around research and archives is that editorial, it has never been found or has not been found at all recently. It was cut out of all of the uh, masters at the newspaper as well as libraries. And so we haven't been able to look to see what the content of that editorial was. So anyways, once that newspaper gets into the hands of the white community, that's how they end up back or down to the courthouse. And then the newspaper makes it into the black community. And the black community is like, well, there's been lynchings in Tulsa of just white men. So if they're not going to protect white men, how are they going to protect a black man? And that really riles up the African American community. Interesting. Um, so we talked a little bit about the newspaper that printed the initial article. After the incident, were there any articles printed in relation to what had happened? And, you know, like, what really was Oklahoma's reaction to this? So 
originally, um, most of Oklahoma was, oops, we're so sorry. We're going to do everything we can to repair the damage. We're going to help people rebuild. We're going to do everything we can. But then you've got the Tulsa Tribune who actually was like, this is to never happen again. We've got to crack down and do what we can so that this kind of violence doesn't happen. And there were a lot of blame towards the um, Black community. And in fact, you know, eventually indictments towards those Black citizens. Um, even the, we've got a telegram um, from the Universal Service that I'll talk about a little later that uh, is very slanted. And so um, a lot of national press, even press from France, are interested in this story. And a lot is um, documented and written within the first year or two. Um, even publishing when buildings are rebuilt and reopened. And then it kind of falls off the news cycle and everybody forgets. And Tulsa starts to do the best job they can of covering it up because they know it's bad for business. It's bad for the community. It's bad for um, oil to have this stain on, on the uh, community here. And David, did we see any reaction that spilled into the OAMC community immediately following the event? So like, were there, you know, anything in the yearbooks and the Ocali? What really happened? So I think Lynn mentioned, you know, the, the, the first kind of spark was the, the May 31st, I think, arrest uh, that happened on that day. Well, that was also the last day of classes uh, for, the, for the college community. Uh, and so by the time things really began to evolve in Tulsa, Classes are dismissed here, uh, and the paper wasn't published uh, during the summer. The college paper uh, didn't exist uh, during the summers. It was just published once a week anyway. And so uh, what I did is I tracked it then when it began publishing again in September, and there's no mention of the event uh, for the, that whole semester uh, in uh, 1921, that, that fall semester. There's no mention of the event at all. Uh, so then I tracked it in, in further into the future. There's no mention of it at all in the college papers. Um, and there's no mention of it in, uh, in the college yearbooks. Uh, now, you have to remember, we're, we're also a segregated campus. Uh, we don't have any Black students attending. Um, and so uh, uh, there is, it's just, we're a perfect example of just, uh, let's, let's just ignore it. Um, and, and, and we're not going to bring it up. And we're going to move on. Um, and so uh, there's, there's just little response or reaction uh, in Stillwater. You know, but there continue to be across the state increased towns that you know develop sundown laws where African Americans are not included in the town, and if they come to town, they need to be out by sundown. Um, and so it it didn't stop racism at that point, even though there was this kind of response. And like Lynn mentioned, there was there was oftentimes almost a blame uh, for the for the black community. You know, they hadn't showed up with arms, uh, you know, to defend this this man from lynching. Well, they had a right to, to show up with arms just as much as anybody else had a right to show up with arms. So, um, so anyway, but yeah, within the OSU, OAMC community at the time, there's just no acknowledgement of it um, and, and no mention of it. Well, if you are just now tuning in, this is the Oklahoma State University Archives Live. I am joined by David Peters, head of the OSU Archives, and Lynn Wallace, the Library Director for OSU Tulsa. Today, we are discussing the Tulsa Race Massacre collection that is housed at the OSU Tulsa Library. Photographs of the event can be found on the, at the OSU Archives Digital Collections. It is important to note that some of the images may be considered graphic. And if you have any questions that you would like David or Lynn to answer, please feel free to post those in the chat and I will ask our guests. As you all do that, we are going to be moving on to questions about the collection itself. It's important to note that the collections we discuss are typically housed in the OSU Stillwater archives. This collection specifically is located in the OSU Tulsa Libraries collection. So Lynn, how did we get the materials for this collection? Well, I will say that OSU Tulsa is a, as a branch campus um, really started creating an archive um, back in the early 2000s, 2000, 2001. Um, we had the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers here on this campus. And we started, you know, that a very slow collection of manuscript by Oklahoma authors. And um, we ended up 
having some manuscript information from um, a well-known Oklahoma author, Michael Wallace. Um, and Michael, with his connections and with the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers connections, connected us with Joy Avery. Joy Avery is a citizen of Tulsa and her um, grandfather, Cyrus Avery, is known as the father of Route 66. And so originally it was, we're gonna get this Route 66 archive that tells all about the creation of the Route 66 um, maps and um, the creation of the highway itself. And then this little tiny collection came along with it. Um, Joy's mother, Ruth Sigler Avery, a well-known Tolson at the time, had been researching the Tulsa Race Massacre because she had been a witness at the age of seven. So uh, Joy donated all of this in 2004 and we just started cultivating, curating and, and putting it all together in finding aids and whatnot starting in 2004. And then we did eventually add it to the digital collections but we've only really added the photos. Okay, and why did OSU begin gathering materials to build this collection? We started adding a lot of Tulsa Race Massacre, um, multimedia, um, any kind, any kind of vertical file information we could we could find, as well as books, because OSU Tulsa is actually on the land that um, is Greenwood. We are in the deep part of Greenwood where the massacre actually occurred. And so we thought it our responsibility to be a campus that held this information. Awesome. And you touched on this a little bit, but could you tell us a little bit more about what the collection has? So uh, most every book that's been written about the Tulsa Race Massacre, of course, at that point in time, it was called the Tulsa Race Riot. And um, so you'll find those as subject headings as well as Tulsa Race Massacre of um, just kind of the tags um, and they're interchangeable. So a lot of the books will have riot in their title. Um, so we have a number of books and almost anything that we can find that's been published on the Tulsa Race Riot slash massacre. We have pamphlets, we've got news and magazine articles, we've got multimedia of VHS and DVD and online. Um, we have maps and books, but the main thing that we have is from the Ruth Sigler Avery collection, over 41 different interviews that she had done and she had completed. These are oral histories. Now, not all of them are, um, have been actually recorded, but several of them were recorded, but they were on cassette tape and reel-to-reel -reel tape, if you even know what reel-to-reel -reel is. So we just digitized those and um, have discovered a few that we hadn't previously transcribed. So we're getting ready to dig into that. Um, but we also have Ruth's unpublished manuscript, Fear the Fifth Horseman, an anthology of the 1921 Tulsa Race Riot. So she was working on a book. She was also working with a few other Tulsans to possibly do a documentary. Um, neither one got published or produced, but um, all of her research, and she specifically was looking at um, the KKK and the white supremacist, suprem the white, um, the concept of why you would fear the black man and what, what hate drives you to do. So that was her, that was her main focus. And David, from an archivist perspective, why do you think it's important that we talk about this still? So uh, one of my, one of my favorite quotes is from George Orwell's 1984. Those who control the present control the past, and those who control the past control the future. So as archivists, we have a responsibility to, to collect those documents and records, which are going to help future generations understand the story of how they got to where they are. And so we're trying to make uh, decisions that are going to impact the future, and we're trying to collect materials that we think are going to make the future better, uh, not worse. And so this is a perfect example um, of where you know certain materials just weren't collected um and so now we're trying to go back and answer the questions whose part of the story was not told um you know so we'll have official you know, newspaper articles that were were kept and saved you know but but and, and there'll be official documents uh, we have some here at our library uh, when a commission was established i think in, in about the year 2000 looking at various aspects of of the the race massacre 
but you always have to, who's, who's part of the story isn't being told yet, you know, and so you have to keep digging, and, and the longer you wait in time after an event occurs, the harder it is to try to, to, to salvage or collect that material, but, you know, we have new technologies now, we have new uh, capabilities now, and so there are some things we are still able to begin working on to, to help uh, understand this story better, and so there are still aspects of the story, even though it's 100 years old now, there are still things we can understand better, uh, and archivists play a role in that, but then a, a lot of other people play a role in that. Um, but our responsibility is to try to retain those documents then and then make them accessible for people in the future and, and that people in the future know where to look for that material. Uh, and so that's, that's our responsibility. And it's a, it's a dilemma I deal with every day, uh, uh, but this is a perfect example of the importance of, of our, the archival record. Well, this is the OSU Archives Live. I am joined with David Peters, the head of archives for OSU, and Lynn Wallace, the library director for OSU Tulsa. As we continue on with our questions about the Tulsa Race Massacre collection, please ask any questions you may have for our guests in the comment section below. We're gonna continue on with some questions. Um, Lynn, is there one item in this collection that comes to the forefront of your mind when you think about its contents? Well, I think there's been nothing more pivotal and yet controversial than one of the interviews that Ruth did in 1972. She interviewed Dick Rowland, the gentleman who was arrested. He was, a, he was later um, sent out of town and moved out of Tulsa, never to return. But um, Ruth interviewed his mother, Damie Rowland Ford in 1972. At that time, Damie was 83 years old. And it gives it, she gave a great background to Dick Rowland's life, and then some information about what happened after the massacre when he left town. And um, there's even part of this interview that is used for The Burning by Tim Madigan, as well as it shows up in another book called Angels of Mercy. Um, and she talks uh, about um, the fact that the girl in the elevator named Sarah Page and Dick actually knew each other and they were friends. And so this is information that had never seen the light of day. But here's where the controversy comes in. She was 83. How much can you believe what she says? So she talks about how Dick wrote to her once a month or whatnot from wherever he was in his travels. He ends up in Portland, Oregon. Um, and if we had those letters, we would have corroborating evidence. And this is where that responsibility and the fact that you can't get those archives 100 years later if there weren't any descendants that Damie's letters and Dick's letters went to. I think another one that is very telling about the times is a telegram that we have from the Universal Service that I kind of mentioned um, before as a teaser, where just the language used of reports here indicate Negroes tried to take law in their own hands and that whites acted with great forbearance and caring for unarmed Negro men, women, and children. Um, please give us the facts and basically who's to blame. And so looking at the context of just how racist even the universal press was of trying to get information, it was very slanted. They didn't just say, hey, what happened? It was very targeted. I think well, we those two are very, very significant. Sorry for interrupting you. So, so no, sorry. No. Um, but thank you for that answer. Um, we do have a question from our audience. This comes from Bonnie. She wants to know what kinds of research projects have you come from, have you seen come from the collection? So right now we're working with an undergraduate group of students. Um, in American studies. They're doing a, a class called Introduction to Digital um, Media or Introduction to Digital Humanities. I apologize, Digital Humanities. And so we have partnered with both Edmund Lowe and the faculty member. They're looking at all of the photos to see if they can add any context in tags for that, as well as putting together kind of some digital humanities projects with uh, specialized software that we're hoping to reveal their work um, at the end of the semester in just a few weeks. So I'm excited to see what they come up with. Um, and, you know, we're, we look for any other kinds of partnerships as well. Awesome. And Lynn, how can we access this collection? 
Well, the um, right now students are allowed in the library um, and you can come and make an appointment if you'd like to look at them. For community members, we also ask for an appointment during COVID days. Um, most all of the interviews are transcribed and in written form as well as her um, documents and they have not been digitized. So you would need to physically come to Tulsa or if you're located you know, way far out where travel is not, not cap you're not capable of traveling, we can at that point um, work with you long distance to view some of these items. Okay, and you, you really did just touch on this, but Shelly wants to know um, if the interview with the family member of Dick Rowland is digitally available. It is not at this point, no. Um, we will start adding some things and that might be one of them that we do add since it's already been in print. Awesome. And David, is there anything here that we have in Stillwater that could add to this collection? So there, there are several items that we have. Uh, first of all, we have a book. It was titled Events of the Tulsa Massacre. Uh, it was written by an African-American woman uh, named uh, Mary Jones Parrish. And so we both, we have two original copies and they were, I think, printed about 1923, 22, 23. So immediately after the event, uh, this book is published, but we have two original copies and then a facsimile that was uh, created uh, several years ago uh, through uh, some efforts. Um, so we have that book, um, and then we have uh, a collection from a Robert Norris. It's, it's called, the, the collection is titled The Black Military Collection, but he has uh, a, a large box filled with documents related to the Tulsa Race Massacre, uh, both reports that were done at the time, uh, newspaper articles that were clipped from various papers, uh, both in Oklahoma and other places, uh, various commissions that have uh, been enacted over time and, and the results from those studies. Uh, and so it's, it's quite an extensive uh, batch of material. Uh, and it's, it's uh, from Robert Norris, who was a, a former uh, uh, lawyer in Arkansas, I believe, but originally from Oklahoma. So we have uh, that material also. Uh, and then uh, recently we purchased uh, the 1941, it was called the 1941 Negro Directory of Tulsa. Uh, and so, you know, oftentimes, um, we think it's important to both look at causal uh, agents for things that happened, then trying to describe what actually happened, and then what was the impact of that? What, what, what happened later? Uh, and so the reason we, we uh, uh, agreed to purchase this particular volume is be able to look at uh, Tulsa 20 years after this event. What, what is happening in, in the African-American community now by 1941? Um, you know, and so that's, that's why we have that kind of material, and, and it's been, been a valuable asset, I think, to have that. Uh, so we do have a few related uh, items uh, and collections, um, but uh, OSU Tulsa and Lynn have the, I think, the most significant one uh, with the material from uh, uh, that they have. Now, part of that collection, of course, has been digitized, you know, and is available online. So. And we have one more question from Bonnie. Lynn, I believe this is directed for you. Um, is there a timeline for completing the digitization of the collection? Um, we don't have a timeline at this point, no. And, um, you know, you have to work about the sensitivity of descendants of um, the massacre victims, as well as those who we did interviews, that Ruth did interviews with, as well as copyright, because um, Ruth was working on this in the 70s as well. So um, we are trying to determine which ones we're going to be putting online. And so that, that work is, should be coming hopefully within the next few months. Well, David and Lynn, you were both amazing in helping me and our viewers better understand the tragic event known as the Tulsa Race Massacre. Is there anything else you two would like to add before we sign off for the evening? Thank you for the opportunity to highlight something that's in Tulsa. I really appreciate it. And I would say that, you know, we're always looking for um, things to add to this collection. So if you know, or if any of the viewers know of items that would benefit this collection, please reach out to me and um, let's, let's have a conversation. And, and I just appreciate the opportunity of working with Lynn uh, on this collection. We get a lot of questions directly to us because we have the digital surrogates of it, but since she actually has the collection and she's always been very helpful for patrons who've tried to contact and find out more. So it's, it's been uh, wonderful working with you, Lynn.
Well, if you want to learn more about OSU's archives, visit archives.library.okstate.edu. To visit Oklahoma State Tulsa's library page, visit Tulsa. Sorry, visit tulsa.okstate.edu slash library. There you will also be able to find some other data collections that it houses. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to DM us on Facebook at Oklahoma State University Archives. David and Lynn, you are both so awesome in, for meeting with me today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. Quick reminder, this is our final episode for the semester. And we will see you guys next semester. Oh, my last one, my last Archives Live. So go folks. <laughs>